I'm Shondell Henson. I'm one of the professors in the math department. I also have an appointment in biology, and my re research is in dynamical systems theory, how things change over time. So that's pretty cool because everything changes over time, doesn't it? So it's the theory of, well, I don't want to call it the theory of everything because then I would be encroaching on something the physicists use. <laughs> So today, I'm going to talk to you about the structure of knowledge, mathematics, science, and the humanities. And we have a bunch of humanities people here today, which is awesome, because we're all on the same road, and we need to understand how we all fit together. So the liberal arts, these are classical uh, areas of study about what it means to be human and to acquire knowledge as a human being. And these things, over the years, have settled into certain kinds of epistemologies or ways of knowing. And here I've listed the liberal arts for you today, the way we think of them today. Um, we started out classically with seven liberal arts, and you'll be glad to know that three of those were basically mathematics. Uh, we had logic, we had geometry, and arithmetic as three of the seven classical liberal arts. The liberal arts um, are composed of the, natural and bio, the physical and natural sciences, physics, biology, chemistry, and then the social and behavioral sciences, communication, psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science, as well as the humanities, art, English, history, music, modern languages, philosophy, theology, religion, and mathematics is also one of the liberal arts. And I've put it by itself because it has a special way of knowing. It has a certain kind of epistemology that is different from the others, as we'll learn. So the liberal arts help us to formulate and ask questions such as, what can we know and how do we know it? What does it mean to be human? What is a good human? What is a responsible and just citizen? Is there anything beyond humanity in the material measurable universe? What is the nature of good and evil? What does it mean to follow Christ in the 21st century? How should I live? The humanities help us formulate and think very deeply about these kinds of questions. I want to start with the first question, which is, what can we know and how do we know it? And I'll be talking to you about the field of epistemology, which is the theory of how we know things. So let's talk about some ways of knowing. And we'll start with sort of the simplest ways, and then we'll build out to more complex ways of knowing. The sort of simplest way to know something is through what we call deductive reasoning, which is from the general to the specific. So here's a little cartoon that illustrates what we call syllogistic reasoning, which is deduction. All Andrews University students own cars. Julie is an Andrews University student, and therefore Julie owns a car. So that is reasoning from the general to the specific. That's called deduction. OK, you with me? Good. So pure mathematics is actually just the deductive method. Pure mathematics just uses induction. Applied mathematics is another animal. It's a little more like science. But mathematics is deduction. OK, so we start there. Now, the mathematical method is made up of things called definitions and axioms. Axioms are statements that we just take without any proof. We just take them to be true. Now, axioms, you wouldn't want to set up an axiom for every single thing you want like to be true because uh, that would be trivial, right? That would trivialize everything. So you want a finite number of axioms in your system. And all you care about, you don't care if they're true in the real world. All you care about is that they are independent and consistent. Now, independent axioms just means that you can't derive one of them from the others. So each one of them is independent. It doesn't follow from the others. <laughs> Consistent just means that two axioms do not contradict each other. So they never contradict each other. And then from these primitive ideas, you, you do something called a proof in mathematics, and you, you derive statements that are called theorems. 
Now, a proof is nothing more than a finite number of deductive steps, okay? I showed you a deductive step a few moments ago. You put a finite number of those together and you get what's called a proof of a theorem, and then from theorems you derive more theorems and so forth and so on and so on. Okay, so that's what we do in mathematics. Now, I'm not going to go through this example in detail, but I just want you to all see that mathematics takes ideas, fundamental primitive ideas, and codifies them in symbols. And so here's a simple example of what we do as mathematicians. You begin with a definition, A is a subset of B if and only if for all X. If X is in A, then X is in B. That's a definition of what it means to be a subset. And then we state things called theorems. Before they're proved, they're called conjectures. So they're candidates for theoremhood. Okay? But a, a theorem is something we can prove. And if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C. Proof. Assume the first part. Assume A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C. Then, then you unpack it using the definition of subset. You say, well, if X is in A, then X has to be in B, because A is a subset of B. And then X has to be in C, because B is a subset of C. But, if a is, uh, but whenever you have X in A, if X is in C, that's by definition A is a subset of C, QED. We're done. Box. End of proof. That's the kind of thing we do. Now, what are the properties of this deductive method? Well, mathematics is the only discipline where arguments are 100% conclusive. So it's the only discipline where, discipline where there is proof. And the conclusion must be true if the premises are true. Okay? Math has a special distinction that way. Now, what is the scope of the deductive method? And this isn't quite so cheerful. Okay, the scope of the deductive method is pretty small because deduction simply extracts, teases out information that's already hidden in the axioms, see? It's not creating new information about reality. You see what I mean? See what I'm saying? Deduction is not creating new information about reality in that sense. It's helping you see things you didn't see before, but they were already contained in your axioms. Pure deduction cannot, in fact, address questions about physical reality. So pure mathematics doesn't care about physical reality. It does not address that. <laughs> Even less so does it address questions of meaning. You cannot address questions of meaning using pure mathematics. Okay? So it's limited in scope. In fact, there's even a theoretical limit. Uh, to scope, and some of you math majors heard, may have heard of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Basically, it's this really interesting theorem that says that no system, at least as complicated as the natural numbers, can be finitely axiomatized. And that is, um, there exist truths in that system that you can never prove. There exist unprovable truths. And this theorem doomed the efforts of Russell and Whitehead to completely mathematize philosophy. That's what they were going to do. They set out to take philosophy, they were going to put together axioms, uh, you know, symbols, definitions, and completely reduce human philosophy to mathematics. Well, the Gerdel's incompleteness theorem doomed that effort. Now, let's turn to the next type of reasoning, which is a bit more complicated. Induction, reasoning from the specific to the general. This is reasoning from evidence, okay? So here's a little cartoon example of induction. All the Andrews uh, students I've taught this year own cars. Julie owns a car, Daniel owns a car, Yasser owns a car, turns out he doesn't, but let's say he does, and you know, and so forth. Therefore, I conclude that all Andrews University students own cars. Now, is this 100% conclusive? No. Obviously, I can go astray in this type of reasoning. So, in terms of uh, conclusivity, not 100% conclusive unless you observe every single data point. Now, if I checked out every single Andrews University student, then I could say something, right? But unless you observe every data point, it's not conclusive. 
And your level of confidence in your conclusion is based on you know, how good your data are, the accuracy of your measurement, the rigor of your analysis, you know, and so forth. What is the scope of the inductive method? Well, I hope you can see that since you're reasoning from evidence, the inductive method can suggest new things about reality. So we can actually learn more stuff about reality using the inductive method. But there is a limit to the inductive method. It cannot address questions of meaning on its own. Okay, So there's still this limitation. Uh, what does it mean to be human? Uh, well, I don't think the inductive method is going to totally help me there. So think of a Venn diagram where these are not, um, these circles do not show knowledge, but they show the methods of obtaining knowledge. So the smaller circle is the deductive method, mathematics. The larger circle that contained it is the scientific method, which is uses both deduction and induction. In fact, let's talk about that a little more. So this is a cartoon of the scientific method. Now, many of you have had a science class, so you kind of know how this works, but, but let's kind of reduce it down to its, uh, its least common denominators, okay? So you can start anywhere on this circle when you do science, but let's just start at the top. So hypotheses are statements that you make that are true or false, and you're making them about reality, and you're trying to figure out whether or not they're true. Okay, so from your hypotheses, you deduce things. Those are called predictions. So you use the deductive method and you say, well, if my hypothesis is true, then such and such and such and such must be true. That's, you're making a prediction about reality. Then you go out and observe the real world. And you use your data that you observe to test that prediction. And then, usually you have to revise your hypotheses. So you use induction from your observations to induce a new hypothesis. Let me give you a cartoon example. So let me start down there at, uh, at 8 o'clock. So all the Andrews students I taught this year own cars, right? And so I'm going to do induction. Whoops. I'm going to do induction and infer that all Andrews students own cars. OK? That, from that, I can make a deductive prediction. Lisa's an Andrews student, therefore Lisa owns a car, right? So that's a prediction. Then I go out and collect my data about Lisa, right? And I find out that actually that car she drives, it's Lisa's parents own that car, right? So, so all right, so I'm going to have to go up and revise my hypothesis. And you keep going around until until your predictions match your observations to a sufficiently high degree. Does that make sense? That's what science is. So if you imagine going around and around this circle many times, hopefully it's going to tighten in on something called the truth. Now, what makes it tighten in? Now, why don't you just zip around this circle infinitely many times? Well, we have this thing called peer review in science. That means that when I write a paper, scientific paper, it's sent out to experts in my field, and they look at it very, very carefully, um, you know, with a, a magnifying glass. And they look at all my reasoning and everything I did, and then they send back tons of criticisms, OK? And then I make the paper better and it gets sent out for review again. And I get tons of criticisms back. And you just keep doing this process. That's called the process of peer review. And by the time you get your paper accepted, it turns out to be very, very good because of that process. So people are going to tell you that science has bias. It does. But it also has a built-in mechanism to make bias as small as possible. And that's called peer review, and it works very, very well. Well, this thing about the truth, what's the truth, you know? What is that supposed to be? Well, I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that some things work 
and other things don't work. I can tell you that astronomy works, and I can tell you that astrology does not work. All right? So if we want to take that kind of practical uh, approach to truth, then I want you to consider the fact that technology and medicine, for example, work very, very, very well. Okay? So in some sense, science approaches the truth over time. Now, uh, let's look at some of the properties of science. So in terms of conclusivity, is it conclusive? No, because it involves induction. So it's not 100% conclusive. Um, and again, the level of confidence is based on the strength of your data set, the accuracy of your measurements, the rigor of your analysis, um, and, and also the ability of your theory to predict unusual things. And then you go out in the field and you find these unusual things and that really strengthens your argument. What is the scope of science? So science is quite powerful, um, but it has limitations. So it can create new knowledge about physical reality, but it cannot address questions of meaning. Science is not designed to do that. There's even a theoretical limitation to the scope of science, um, I think. I think it's probably fair to say that the human brain cannot explain completely the human brain. Uh, because as a mathematician, that immediately makes me think of problems of self-referentiality. Okay? So I think that's probably a theoretical limit in our effort to understand the human mind. So let's turn our attention now to humanities. The humanities do use deduction. They do use induction. But they also use other ways of knowing. Things that are not irrational or irrational, but extra-rational. Things beyond induction and deduction. Um, let's see. Maybe I need to give you some examples. So here's my first example. This is art. This is a painting, a very famous painting, by a Canadian artist, Tom Thompson, associated with a group of seven. And they painted the Canadian wilderness and the, tried to get across the character of Canada. This painting hardly looks like a photograph, okay? It's not realistic in that sense. But if you've ever been to the Canadian Shield, which is that vast wilderness where granite under your feet and lakes and sky, if you've ever been to the Canadian Shield, you know that this is the Canadian Shield. I mean, this transports you to the Canadian Shield. This, this painting is way more true than any photograph could be. This is The West Wind by Tom Thompson. And so artists talk about a lie that tells the truth. Oh, in some sense, you, in some crude sense, you could call this painting a lie, right? But it tells the truth. Let me give you another example. Um, so this is from one of the most famous novels ever written. It's the opening lines. Does anybody know what novel this is from? Uh, Lisa, you know. What is it? Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina by, by? Yeah, that's right. Tolstoy. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. This novel, one of the greatest ever written, is a lie that tells the truth. It's not true in some crude literal sense, right? But it... If you read the first chapter, you will be drawn in because of the truthfulness of this novel. It's, it gives me chills to even think about it. Let me give you one more example um, of other ways of knowing, okay? So this is, a, this is part of the score from Handel's Messiah, Handel's Messiah, and this is part of the chorus, uh, All We Like Sheep, and you may know the words to that. We've gone astray, everyone turned to his own, laid on him the iniquity of us all. And right here in the score, between here and here, there's this tremendous change in mood. 
Okay, and I'm gonna play this for you where it switches over. So this is a dance over here. You just, you just wanna dance, it's so much fun. And suddenly, suddenly, there is this change, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And as you listen to it, recognize your, your um, physiological response. You can hardly breathe at the end. You can hardly breathe. So let me play this for you. So I'm going to play just a, a little bit from the very first of it, and then I'll come right to this, this part right here. Okay, let me see if I can get it loud enough. You know, so so happy and you, you know, having fun. You could just dance around. Okay, I'm going to just move over towards where we have that switch so you can hear it. What kind of reasoning is that? I mean, you can't breathe at the end. So this whole business, we call it soteriology and theology, right? Uh, the meaning of Christ's death, why did Christ die for us? What does that mean anyway? That the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I don't know from a deductive and inductive point of view. I just know that there's something incredibly deeply true there that moves the inside of me. It moves my whole being. And I know there's something really, really deep there. How about this? It's my last example for how we know things. Where does that appear? Where have you read that before? John, right. What does that mean from the point of view of science or mathematics or induction or deduction? I don't know. Those things don't go far enough to encompass this deep truth that's at the fundamental fabric and existence of reality. So I hope you can see that Mathematics is pure deduction. Science is deduction and induction. And then there's a whole other world out there, folks. And I'm talking to our math and physics majors. There's a whole other world out there that involves other ways of knowing as well, in addition to induction and deduction. The humanities, philosophy, theology, religion, other ways of knowing. Now, to summarize the scope, 
I hope you can see that as we move from right to left, from math to science to the humanities, the scope of the kinds of questions that can be addressed rises dramatically. So remember, math can't really tell us any new information about the physical world. Science can, but it cannot address questions of meaning, whereas humanities can address questions of meaning. Now on the other hand, what about conclusivity? It goes the other way. And this is interesting, isn't it? Math is the only discipline which is 100% conclusive. Science is not 100% conclusive, but it works very, very well, as we discussed. Humanities are the least conclusive. And this, this brings up, what do I mean by conclusive? Well, what I mean is, not how much you believe it, but how well you can convince other people of what you know. If you can convince someone else of what you know, then that's conclusive. And if you can't, then that's not very conclusive. So you can see that the curve goes the other direction. Let's superimpose these two curves. The reason science is so powerful in our world today is because it happens at the intersection of these two curves. So it can, it can address quite a few questions that we'd like to know, things about physical reality. And it's still fairly conclusive, you know? It's not 100% conclusive, but the scientific method can work very, very well under peer review. So that's kind of why science is so powerful in our world today. But remember, it cannot address the really big questions. So I like to call these circles nested epistemologies. They're, they're methods of knowing, OK? Nested epistemologies. They all have the same goal, I think, which is understanding truth and reality, whatever that means. But they all have that same goal. But they have different methods, OK? So there are different ways of knowing. There are different standards of warranty or conclusiveness. And there are different kinds of questions that they can address. Let me stop and talk just a moment about science and religion, because a lot of people think those are in conflict. They cannot be. Um, conflict models, uh, there are a couple ways to look at it. Some people think science removes the need for religion. Okay, we could call that scientific materialism. Um, some of the proponents of that might be Rich Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett. Other people think that the Bible is a science textbook and it obviates the need for science. Okay, and I think most of you realize that that's not true. Well, what about a third way, the no conflict model? Well, there's a couple ways to go here as well. Stephen Jay Gould is a biologist, a um, famous biologist at Harvard, and he felt that there was no conflict between science and religions because they have what he called non-overlapping magisteria. So they have, um, they have, weight in different areas of human endeavor. Um, and so I think, though, that I don't totally, I, I, I respect Gould a lot for his peacemaking efforts, but I don't totally agree. I actually think that science and religion have the same goals. And I prefer to think of it using the model of nested epistemology instead of non-overlapping magisteria. So let's talk about these boundaries for a moment. How permeable are these boundaries between types of knowing? And this is kind of fun. So um, like, can anything in this outer boundary where the humanities lives, can any of that stuff ever make it into the middle, the inner circle where mathematics lives? And the answer is yes. I could get inspiration for my math from music or dreams. In fact, I find that listening to Bach fugues helps me do mathematics, okay? And I, as a graduate student, I had dreams about how to solve problems. And they were often right. Okay, so <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> So as a graduate student, you um, spend an inordinate amount of time as a math graduate student <laughs> trying to solve a particular problem. And instead of a few hours, folks, it can take weeks or even months. And you think about it, you think so hard about it, 
Um, but when you're not thinking about it, that's when the answers pop into your head. And in particular, when you sleep, um, all this REM sleep is going on, and you'll have a dream. And so you always want to write down the solution. When you wake up, it might not be true, but then again, it might actually work. So uh, we also, at, like scientists, we observe patterns, and that helps us conjecture statements as you know possible theorems. Well, wait a minute, I thought math was pure deduction. How come all this other stuff can come into it? Well, when you get the final product, and here's the point, when you do the final product in mathematics, it's only deduction. You've got definitions, axioms, theorems, and proofs, and that's it. You don't have anything in there about your dreams. You don't say anything in there about your prayers, and I'm, I had plenty of those about those theorems too. You don't say anything about that. Uh, you don't say anything about your inductive process looking for patterns. Oh no, it's deduction only in the final product. Similarly, um, we have these boundary crossings in, uh, in science. So again, inspiration, dreams, music, those things inspire scientists, okay? Last Sabbath, I heard a talk by Gary Fraser, who runs the big Adventist health study. Well, those hypotheses that he is testing, you know, those things were suggested by Ellen White, right? And other health reformers in the 19th century. But that's fine, they make great scientific hypotheses. But when you do your final product in science, it does not contain those sources, okay? It only contains deduction and induction using the scientific method. You don't say anything about Mrs. White when you write a scientific paper. You don't say anything about, you know, dreams or music, okay? Sounds boring? No, I know you're STEM majors, it doesn't sound boring. Now I want to talk about boundary violations. So when is crossing the boundary a bad thing? Well, I'll give you a couple, just a few examples. Um, one is what we would call postmodernist deconstruction of science. So, you know, without making a cartoon of it, here's the main idea, I think. Um, all right, so all sciences are biased. Okay, yep, that's true. Um, so therefore, uh, each is each kind of science is equally valid, because they're all biased anyway. Uh, not hardly, okay, because you know that astronomy works better than astrology. Psychology even works better than phrenology. And chemistry works better than alchemy, right? Uh, yeah, so we always have bias in all kinds of, all, all sciences, but not all systems of thought are equally valid, okay? Some work and some don't, let's be clear. So that's a boundary violation. Here's one of my most obnoxious boundary violations ever. Now, I'm a feminist, but in the 1980s, there was a small group of feminists who deconstructed mathematics because the, the tests at the time were showing that women were not as good at mathematics. And so instead of looking at those tests and saying there's something wrong here, folks, um, no, they decided that there was something wrong with mathematics. It was inherently masculine. You know, proofs, masculine. Um, let's soften this thing a bit so that women can do it. Well, you can imagine how obnoxious that was to female mathematicians everywhere. Very obnoxious um, to say that we're not women, okay? And um, in fact, as those studies have you know, been redone uh, in the subsequent decades, there's no difference in the inheritability of men and women to do mathematics, right? So the problem was in the design of the study and so forth. Anyway, this is an, exa an example of how um, there was a boundary violation into the inner sanctum, and uh, fortunately that's gone away. Here's actually one of the most serious boundary violations. Uh, and I say this with all respect, but when people pose religion as a purely deductive system, um, that's bad news. Let me explain what I mean. You may have heard somebody say, the Bible is my axiom and I just take everything from that. Okay, so that's a deductive system, but 
You know the problem with deductive systems. They don't have any scope hardly. The scope is small. And religion is supposed to tell us about the deep things of humanity, the deep things of God. And so we need some scope there, right? There's no way to crush religion into a deductive system without totally destroying all the things that are so wonderful about religion. Okay? So that's a particularly bad one. Making the Bible into an axiom, set of axioms and trying to use the axiomatic method on it. Do you realize that when you read the words on the page, it's going through your senses and your physiology and it's therefore induction? Boundary violation. Um, materialists, this is going the other direction. Scientific materialists sometimes attempt to limit philosophical uh, possibilities. Uh, you know, you shouldn't believe in God or whatever. Uh, you know, scientific materialism explains all. That's a boundary violation. Uh, it's hard for me to understand how such a person can go home and realize that he or she loves their spouse or watch a beautiful sunset. So, in summary, um, these areas of human endeavor have the same goal, I think. But they do have different types of knowing, okay? And they, they, they address different types of questions. And they have different standards of proof. And the bigger, bigger circles use more types of knowing. And they can address more types of questions. The humanities address all the big questions. The smaller circles provide more warranty to convince someone else of what you know. The bigger circles include, and hence cannot logically con uh, contradict the smaller circles. Ah, no contradictions. Uh, paradoxes, complex paradoxes, yes. Logical contradictions, no. Bigger circles nourish and inspire the smaller circles, but they cannot be included. Those nourishments cannot be included in the final arguments or products of the smaller circles, which are constrained by their methodologies. So what I've talked to you about here is a model. Now, a model is a, a mock-up, a cartoon of a real thing um, that's made to be simpler than the original so that we can understand it and hang ideas on it. This is a model, and as a model, it's not purporting to be the whole thing, and it's not purporting to be perfect or totally accurate, but it is saying this is a way to think about different spheres of knowledge and how they fit together. So modify this model yourself, uh, make it better, work on it, and it will help you to think. And finally, last of all, study all the liberal arts you can get your hands on. Study all the literature you can. Study all the history you can. Learn to think historically. Study statistics. Learn to think statistically. That's a big one. Learn uh, all you can about the visual arts, art, and music. And as you do, you'll not only enrich your life, and you, you'll grow those places in your mind that, that God gave you. Uh, but also, you're going to find out that in your particular career, as an engineer or a mathematician or scientist or whatever you're going to do, you'll find that you have such a bigger uh, view of what's going on that you're going to rise in your career rapidly. Okay? It's going to help you in your career to study these things, the liberal arts. Um, we call them general education classes. That's a put down. We call them ACE here at Andrews. Andrews core experience. experience. Yeah, that's better, right? Study all the liberal arts you can, including the humanities and the social sciences. Um, well, I think that's all I wanted to say. And I'll bet you might have some questions or discussion. Yes. So how much liberal arts study is too much? Very, very good question. Perhaps we should look to MIT, uh, you know, because you're a science math student. Let's look to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is one of the greatest institutions in the world, uh, and it's a STEM school. 
um, they have their students um, take a curriculum such that every fourth course is a humanities course. So that's what they believe. Um, and we recently did a poll of math and science teachers here at Andrews University, and 100% of them said that it's extremely important or very important for the STEM students to get a strong grounding in the humanities and the social sciences. So obviously you can't take so much that you just get you know, way overloaded with credits and, and have to spend several more years here and you know, debt and all that. So it has to be within reason. But within reason, take as much of the humanities as you can. That would be my advice. Oh, please, go ahead. What do you see as the merit? Do you see much merit in taking human and studying humanities at a like university level or academic level versus like a personal level? Um, that's a really good question. Can, can I just study humanities on a personal level? And, and I do. It's something I plan to do my whole life long. Um, I'm taking an art class right now, for example. But I think at university, um, especially in the United States, in the United States system, we, we do the humanities and the, the liberal arts at the university level, whereas in the European system, they do more at the high school level. But in, in our system of education here, I think it's extremely important to do it at university because you have these teachers who are experts in those areas. And they're not just like really good PhDs, they're publishing in those areas. They know all the big things going on and you're in small classes at Andrews with those people and you're surrounded by other students who are saying things and challenging each other. And it's just really hard to, um, it's really hard to duplicate that experience on one's own. Does that make sense? But I say both and. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Oh, yeah. What are some uh, maybe tips or ways to identify and reconcile uh, paradoxes? and like comparing that with contradiction. Yeah, I think, yeah, Michael, that's a really good question. So I made this distinction between paradoxes and contradictions. So let me just say a little more about that before I think about the answer. Um, so paradoxes are not logical contradictions. They're just these, these really complex things that sound contradictory, but if you knew the whole story, they wouldn't be contradictory because it's just a complex subject. Logical contradictions are um, something else entirely. It's when somebody says A and not A are true at the same time. Like, uh, not really, okay? So, um, what did you ask, Michael? How to reconcile paradoxes. How to recognize them. How to recognize and reconcile them. Yeah, I, you know, I, I really don't know. To be honest with you, the paradoxes uh, with which I am aware are so fundamentally deep to the structure of the universe that I kind of doubt I'll ever understand enough about this, the whole context of it to, to, to understand why it's not a contradiction. And so I have learned to live with ambiguity. So if I don't totally understand something, you know, like there looks to be a, a contradiction maybe in science and religion on some point, and, and I kind of understand the science pretty well, but I can also read the words in the Bible, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I have learned to be resilient and live with ambiguity and to recognize that not only am I got, not going to understand enough in this life to, 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 to resolve it, but that, um, that there's something wonderful for, for me, because I'm a person of faith, there's something wonderful about being able to live with amb ambiguity because that's what faith is. And, and if I understood everything, I couldn't have faith. And I care about having faith. And, you know, and if I understood everything, or thought I did, which is more likely, right? If I, if I thought I understood everything, I would be trying to control what other people thought, wouldn't I? Because we do that as human beings. And so I think another reason it's a great thing to be at university is because we learn to live with ambiguity, to, to not have the answer to everything, to realize we don't understand everything, and to yet be able to move forward as people of faith and as good people. 
um, and continue to, to think and be excited about the big questions.